It's time to go to work with Kansas City's entrepreneurs, inventors, brand builders, and business icons. The biggest benefit of being locally owned is that um, you know all of us as owners are here all the time, so, so we see exactly what's happening. People here in Kansas City still think the same way that people in LA and New York and so on and so forth do and can produce the same quality of product just with a better lifestyle. You have to have a family member or a friend or somebody who's going to actually believe in the product to keep it going. Experience the hands-on fits and starts of innovative business building going on right here, right now, in our community. This is reality TV that works. Startups made in Kansas City. I'm Jeff Tidball and you're at River Key Creative. We're a design firm in Kansas City. We do video production and animation and interactive and all kinds of stuff that combines all three of them. And I wanted to introduce you first of all to our sales gong. Anybody on our sales force who sells something gets to come up and ring the gong when the deal is done. This was all of 20 bucks. I think we got this on eBay. What does River Key Creative do? We can sum it up in, in probably uh, three or four words and that is we make stuff that's cool. Um, somebody comes up and says, wow, that's cool, that's different, I've never seen that. But that also that takes somebody's brand or somebody's product or somebody's something, widget, whatever it is, and helps it stand out. About half of our animation work comes from pro sports teams. We do in-stadium displays, and so Brian is working on stuff for the upcoming Major League Baseball season. Um, the Braves are a client, have been for a long time, so the stuff that you're seeing here is stuff that will be on their main board, on their LED boards, um, and just all around their stadium when baseball starts up in Atlanta. Naturally, all the teams need all their stuff at the same time, so all the clients have exactly the same deadline, and it's very good times here in late March. Lots of the couches getting slept on overnight. So once you do great work for one team, the rest of the league hears about it. All of the people who do business and game day entertainment move from team to team. They've got the same trade associations, so they see great work for one team. They want to find out who did it and get that stuff in their stadium as well. In the sports and entertainment uh, space that we compete in for graphics and motion graphics and things like that, one of our biggest competitors and what we find ourselves actually even competing is with uh, some companies inside of LA and New York. And, and one of the things that we've actually found out, which is really cool, is that pound for pound our quality is exactly the same, um, but we can be a little more competitive on our price because we have better cost of living, um, you know, somebody can come down here and, and, and live better and we don't have to pay the, the, as high salaries as they do. So we end up, you, you know, usually winning uh, jobs inside of that, uh, inside of pitches like that that we do because of that. And that's, uh, that's been a real uh, key factor in, in being able to close some big clients around the United States. One of the things oh, that God. we do for our, uh, for a lot of our pro sports clients is we put in interactive games inside the stadium and that's a space where we have very little if any competition at all. One of our new initiatives is to do generic versions of all of those games that can be put inside colleges, can be put inside minor league stadiums. They don't have as big of budgets, but we're doing this big league interactive initiative so that they can self-customize those software packages, get them with a smaller investment, but still have an interactive, say, Twitter client that they can put on their big board, have a family feud style game that they can run during halftime and that kind of thing. So that's the, the website that we've been trying to get up this week. In today's marketplace, there are thousands of ways to make a product stand out, but you're always looking for the newest, most innovative way to make your product stand out. And whether that be a video or a touchscreen or an app or any sort of medium that you can think of that will take and make that product stand out and leave somebody with the impression either that was cool or wow, I didn't know that, or you know, I'd like to try that product. That's, that's pretty much in a nutshell what what we do and what we try to aim to do when we're finished with the project. If we've hit our mark and we've done what we said we're going to do for the client, the client's going to walk away and say, I didn't think we could do that, but we did. One of the things um, that, that is important in a service-based business is, is your team, right? You rely on that sort of team. Um, we've kind of specialized a team in three different departments uh, because we're trying to 
uh, incorporate not only the technology and the programming side, but also the creative and the, the what I call the wow side. I often refer to it as a you don't have a Ferrari without a fast engine, and you don't have a, a fast engine without a Ferrari looking really slick. So you've got to have both of those components. So on our programming and our, and our programming side, we've had to really bring in some high-end programmers that understand how to program in many different languages, um, how to program some of this new technology for touch screens and for all the things that are out there um, that uh, are new, to, new and emerging technologies. And then on the design side, um, uh, you really obviously want to make that best foot, foot forward. So we've, um, we've had to, to really kind of attract talent to Kansas City here, um, which is a, uh, at times can be a tough, uh, a tough road. So let me introduce you to our uh, director of animation. He is here, well, this is your first week, right? Started Monday or last week? That's correct, Monday. And came up from San Diego in Southern California, did a bunch of work on a, some huge feature films. I was a comp supervisor for um, Transformers for uh, 3D stereoscopic composing and uh, worked on Pirates of the Caribbean, Avengers, Amazing Spider-Man, Smurfs, <laughs> so, and um, John Carter, we thought that was going to be huge, but it turned out to be a big flop, so. Sometimes that can be a challenge to find uh, talent that uh, not only understands what a great uh, community Kansas City is and where it is an awesome place to live, um, but also understands that people here in Kansas City still think the same way that people in LA and New York and so on and so forth do and can produce the same quality of product just with a better lifestyle here. Working in LA compared to here is, uh, is quite a bit different. This is uh, more of a, I don't want to say laid back environment, but LA is very um, kind of cutthroat, house on bustle, you know, factory type uh, sweatshop host environments. Not quite that bad, but it kind of feels like at times you're working, like I said, 24 7, seven days a week. Um, seems like uh, Transformers was 15 hour plus days for me, um, seven days a week for like eight months straight. So, um, yeah, the, the work environment and uh, just the, you know, traffic and the combustion, it, you know, all the hustle and bustle and the people, and it just, uh, people are friendlier here. I was born in here and all my family's here and I, I kind of felt it was time and came back for a number of visits and saw how Kansas City has come up, you know. It used to be you didn't really want to live downtown, actually, I remember, and now people are actually moving downtown and living downtown and it seems to be revived a little bit. All the loss and everything, the power and light district and, and all that has, has changed a lot, so uh, I felt it was time and I was hoping to be able to bring experience that I've gained other places back here to Kansas City. And, you know, it's nice to do that it's come up and the, the art environment's changed and it's, it's a more creative, you know, more nicer place. So downstairs we've got uh, edit suites. Right at the moment, I think Andrew is also working on Brave stuff, although not their in-stadium stuff. We're working on a stadium tour application for them, and part of that is video content that's going to go inside. So yeah, is that guy in a kitchen? The early challenges we had inside of our organization, um, simply put, cash. I mean, any business that starts up, they need cash. You need to worry about how you're going to get enough cash in the door to pay either employees or do the work that you're selling, especially when you're a service-based industry. Um, you know, you don't have uh, an IP or a product that you can turn around and, 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 and sell that IP to get cash in the door. So um, you have to find, um, at least for us, we had to find investors and people like that that believed in the dream that would be able to uh, put some money in to get the chairs and the office furniture and the equipment and all the things that you need to get set up to start producing the services that you're, you're going to sell. And so um, a lot of investors, a lot of people that were normally uh, two, three, four, five years ago were a little more likely to um, loosen up and make an investment now are a lot more cautious with uh, their investments. And so that in return um, is making it harder for companies that want to start up today to find uh, that cash they need to start their companies. I don't have any idea why a door like this was originally installed in here, but it seems like a very sensible place to keep a boatload of servers and animation machines and so on. Naturally, all of this is air conditioned down in here to keep all these computers from acting up, but these guys render animation frames. That's a boatload of storage. I have no idea what these are doing up here. 
computers, God knows. I would encourage anyone who's interested in starting up their own design firm, I would say go work for somebody for two, three, four, five years. Understand what it is to have all the facets of business underneath you. Um, have a whole lot of patience for a whole lot of personalities. Um, have definitely try to create a team where you have collaboration because I think that that's one of the things that I see a lot out there is you've got a single artist that starts up a company and they want they just they, they just they spend their whole life and then they get either frustrated and I think because artists need collaboration they need uh, artists or programmers they want collaboration with other people because that's how they grow here you know um, it's it's very collaborative you can bounce ideas off of everybody people t tend to want to work together you know it tends to be a, a friendlier environment whereas uh, in LA it's you really have to break a barrier to get to that point to where you can make those decisions and um, it's, it's not as open to be a conducive creative environment. You know, one of the things that I, I had wished that I had more knowledge and practice and skill and things like that when I started up, but it's just something that you learn along the way. The School of Hard Knocks is business. Um, anybody that is starting up a business, that's what you're doing. You're starting up a business. So books or advice or mentors or anything like that that you can gravitate towards that would be able to help you um, lessen the blow of some of the things that you will learn in the School of Hard Knocks. So that's another successful day at River Key Creative. This is reality TV that works. Startups made in Kansas City. Right on the right side, using his strength and skill on the ball. Inside, quick shot, score! Susie, one nothing spot in Kansas City. I am Rob Heineman. I'm the CEO of Sporting Kansas City. The reason that we changed the name from the Kansas City Wizards to Sporting Kansas City was actually pretty simple. Um, when we looked at every measurable category from a business perspective, merchandise, ticket sales, we were last. And there was really nothing from an ownership perspective that we thought was all that endearing about the name Kansas City Wizards. So what we wanted to do was do something that was different. Uh, we had a lot of different branding agencies say we should change the name to fountains or boulevards or something that was relevant to Kansas City, but what we really wanted to do was do something that what we thought was relevant to what we wanted to do in Kansas City, which was create a vertically integrated sporting club. So for us, the name Sporting Kansas City has always been very literal, and uh, you know it's a name that we knew people would probably be a little cool to at the start, but they've really warmed up to it since. One of the things that we've tried to do uh, in the context of Kansas City sports was be much more transparent and open with our fan base. And you know, the, the, the Chiefs and, and the Royals obviously probably don't have the opportunity to do that quite as much because of some of the rules around their sport. And for us, because Major League Soccer is a little bit newer, we, we felt, uh, let's try it. What, what do we have to lose? And, and so let's try to be as transparent as possible. And, and we still have a sport that we're trying to teach a lot of our fans different nuances within the game. And, and even we as owners are learning more different nuances of the game every day. So for us, we thought, what's the downside? Let's try to be very open. Let's talk to our fans. Let's let them be as much of an owner as we are. And, and so far, I think the returns have been good. Holds it, shoots it, Susie has two. You know, so what's ahead for Sporting Kansas City in 2013? I mean, I think a lot of really great things. I, I think we're going to have a fantastic team, so I think we've got the opportunity to win some championships. And for us, as an organization, that's the most important thing. More important than anything else is, is winning. That's where it all starts here in professional sports. And for the first two years of Sporting Kansas City, we've, we've won. My name is Matt Beasler. I'm number five, and I play defender for Sporting Kansas City. I would have been happy uh, to play anywhere in the country, but the fact that Kansas City drafted me back to my hometown, that was a dream come true for me, and, and that was my number one choice. It's always been my dream to come back and play in Kansas City. I really feel like Kansas City sports fans are the best in the country, and they're very underrated. They're very passionate. They've created an environment that is very hard to play in if you're an opposing team, and it's a big home field advantage for us, and we use that to our advantage. I think right now in Kansas City, you know, Sporting KC is the, the it team. Um, we're the cool team, we're the, the cool place to be on Saturday nights. I think there's a lot of reasons why Sporting KC has been successful in the first two years. I think it starts with the ownership group. Uh, we have very, very dedicated owners, uh, local owners from Kansas City that 
want a Kansas City team to succeed. And I think that goes a long way uh, because that's very rare in today's sports world. The biggest benefit of being locally owned is that um, you know all of us as owners are here all the time. So, so we see exactly what's happening. Uh, we know where the flaws are. We know where the great things are. And we're very committed to Kansas City. We have you know thousands and thousands of people that uh, you know work with us on a daily basis in our organization. So we've got a sense of pride that we want to uphold. And and we always ask the question, why not in Kansas City? Uh, you know, we have New York and L.A. and all all these huge cities in our our league, but. For us, we always say, why can't Kansas City be the model? And, and that's our mindset. It should be, and we want it to be. The biggest challenge with building this franchise was really getting a new stadium. And, you know, we tried several different times in several different places throughout the Kansas City metro area, and, and it was very difficult to do. And, and luckily, we found a great partner in the state of Kansas and the unified government. And ever since then, everything's changed for us. So we went from an organization that really had probably four or 5,000 people coming to our games on average to sold out 20,000 seat stadium and, and really um, everything being completely at a much different level than it used to be. In the stadium, what we tried to do was really have the most cutting edge and technologically advanced building in, in the country. And out of that has spawned a really cool new company called Sporting Innovations. And what Sporting Innovations is about is really creating what we would call fan experience management. And for us, you know, most of us in sports don't really even know who our fans are. We know we have lots of fans that come to games and we know they're really passionate, but we really don't know much about you, even necessarily who you are. So um, at Sporting Innovations, that's really the puzzle that we're trying to put together is who are the fans? What can we do to allow them to feel, again, like they're more in an ownership role around what the experience is like inside of a stadium? And for us, that's a, a really cool thing to work on. You know, another thing that I think sets us apart is we try to be really active on social media. So, you know, for example, we announced our stadium naming rights on Twitter. We announced the building of our stadium on, on Facebook. And, and for us, it's not necessarily as much about traditional media as it is trying to do things in social first. And again, when we look at kind of that 18 to 34 age group, which is what we're really trying to grow and differentiate, that's how they want to be spoken to. And so uh, we made that a big part of, of our communication strategy. And I, I think it does make us a little bit different. You really got to believe in it. You got to buy in and, and try to be a fan as much as possible. I mean, I think that sounds really strange, but the nuance I think that we have as an ownership group is we think like a fan first. And sometimes that probably causes us to do things that most people would think are non-traditional. But most of our non-traditional thinking is exactly what a fan would want or what a fan would think. So uh, for us, it's, it's try to be normal, try to be average. And, and I think that's what we've tried to do and, and, and try to include as many people in sort of our decision making and our brand as possible. And, and for us, it's, it's been working so far. This is reality TV that works. Startups made in Kansas City. The whole idea for the paw wash started for my sixth grade science fair project. I was 12 years old and I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I always had the daily chore of cleaning my dog Sadie's dirty paws. And I thought there had to be an easier way to do this. So I thought I'd kill two birds with one stone and create something to clean her paws and get me an A in the science fair. So that's exactly what I did. I first created some different things with bowls and stuff, and then we went to the barn and got some PVC pipe, and I bought a cap for it, filled it up with water, put some soap in it. My dad actually used it on Sadie, and that's when he told me, hey, Katie, this works, you know. It was... I was in the garage, yeah. and uh, doing some work, and the dog ran in muddy. I put some water in the... Back then, we didn't name it the Paul Walk. Yeah, it was, it was this tube. Put some soap in it and water and then put Sadie's paw in it and cleaned it and Muddy Paul's gone and it's a white labs paw that came out and that's when I went in the house and said, you, you have something here, you need to put some graphics on it and name it. And then she named it the Paul Wash. I handle customer service, the logistics, the shipping, the bookkeeping, and the marketing for the Paul Wash. It is currently sold not only on our website, and you can click a link that says retail locations, and up pops a map of the United States, and it covers all the stores that we sell in. It truly all began with Three Dog Bakery throughout the Kansas City area selling the product, and uh, they are a big local seller of it, um, especially their store down on the plaza. But it's also sold um, by distributors 
here in the United States. And those distributors sell to stores and we sell it worldwide. Well, it was not my first thought to get a patent when I first came up with the paw wash. Um, as a 12 year old kid, all I was interested in what color I wanted it, what designs and stickers I wanted to put on it. But when we actually got the paw wash going, my dad said, no, we need to get this patented. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. I really had no comprehension of what a patent was. Just, just the applications and the cost of a patent can be $20,000, $25,000. And uh, after that, then you have to have a, a factory to make your product. So you have to have molds made, molds 20,000. You've got a large and small unit, and you have mitts. So right there, you're probably at 50,000. And then your first run, you can do a short run, which it's more expensive per unit, just to test the waters like we did to see how it would sell. But then when you make a big run with a container, like a 40-foot 40 40 container or a 20-foot container smaller, then you're getting into the $60,000, $70,000 orders, so on and so forth. And then uh, as you go along too, you have to have attorneys involved, so there's cost incurred there. But I would say literally a quarter of a million dollars just to, to get this company going. A lot of people think I am really rich or a millionaire, but sadly I'm not. Um, I've been, since I've been copied so many times, people say it's a great compliment, but it's extremely costly. First of all, what happened is I got a phone call from a friend who said, hey, congratulations, I saw your product on TV. And I said, uh, we're not out yet. We're, you know, we, we've got our prototypes and things like that. We have our patent, but we're not you know, out of the market. He goes, well, there's something just like yours that you need to look into. So again, we looked into it and uh, contacted our local council, got the product sent to us, investigated it, and they found that uh, one of the claims they felt was being infringed on. And maybe I would have been a lot Further, my profit would have increased a lot if I hadn't had to go through all these lawsuits and troubles, but I mean, that is where the passion comes out of having the paw wash as it's my baby, it's my passion, it's everything. And having my awesome team behind me keeps us pushing forward. You have to have a family member or a friend or somebody who's gonna actually believe in the product to keep it going. Because if you're the only one with the passion and no one, there's no one there to help you or support you, then it's gonna be really hard because you go through some really hard times and having a good family to stay up late with you and box them or do whatever is the best gift. With all the money and the funds my parents put into it, there's no way this would have gotten to the point where it is today because a 12 year old doesn't have that type of money, doesn't even understand Stand. I didn't even understand how much money that would have ever been. So without my parents, my idea would just be an idea and it wouldn't be anywhere to where I am today. As a former teacher, I really enjoyed teaching others, but I have been taught a lot as this business has grown. Um, China, manufacturing, making sure that it uh, arrives in this country, putting containers on the water to get here and then over to the warehouse and from there the shipping and the logistics. It's been a learning experience for that aspect of uh, all that is involved when a product comes to market um, from the ground up. Why we chose to get the product made in China instead of the U.S. is basically because of the price point. We would want to make it here in the United States, but mold cost here in the United States could be 100000 for what we have versus 20000 We looked at local companies here in Kansas City and around the country, uh, great people. And they even said to us, we can't do it and because it, you can't even get it on the market so that the consumer can buy it at, at a good price. It's truly still a small um, organization in terms of when I said shipping and logistics. I box them, I ship them out, I go to UPS, and uh, that's a lot how we do our, our shipping and the postal service. So it's still just truly a small organization, those sold worldwide. Of course, it will be the dream that there's enough financial backing in the future as the business grows, that you are able to have that warehouse that definitely packs it all for you and ships it for you and, and gets it out. But currently, it's, it's just uh, mom and pop and me doing it and taking the calls. And so it's fun. I, I, it's 
full time, full time fun. While my profit isn't exactly where I'd like it to be, there's always gonna be dirty paws, and my business is growing and expanding, and I believe in it with all my heart, and I have the best team behind me, and I know we are gonna to continue to grow and do even more wonderful things. A co-production of KCPT and Outpost Worldwide at home in Kansas City. Production, post, content.